This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Dust Cause Robotics, and today I want to talk about 3D printing in robotics. Today, in late 2021, the number of 3D printers on the market is insane, and the availability of 3D printers is growing rapidly as well. Many local libraries are starting to offer 3D printing especially to students. High schools have them, practically every college or makerspace has them, and pretty much every experienced robot builder owns at least one. I just sold and then bought a second 3D printer this past week. Let me know in the comments if you want to see a video about how I made my decision on what to buy, and how you can decide on one for yourself. However, this time what I want to focus on is the plethora of materials available for 3D printing, and how each one can be applied to robotics. I'm going to add a disclaimer here that I am not a materials scientist, but I am a mechanical engineer in my day job, so I have a good understanding of the meaning of some of the mechanical properties that manufacturers list, and how those can impact the usefulness and applications of a given material. That being said, this is a topic everyone needs to understand, so I'm going to try and approach this with as little engineering jargon and as much practical demonstration as possible, and put it in simple terms that I hope anyone can understand. If you want to hear a lot more about tons of more filaments than I have time to talk about, check out this video from Zach Freeman, where he prints a ton of different filaments as part of like a five-part series where he's going to show at least like 300 different filaments at some point. And if you want to learn more about 3D printing in general and how to pick a printer for yourself, Here's a link to a video series from Tom's 3D. The basics. Before we talk about materials, we need to address what you need to do to actually print them. I'm about to make a bunch of general statements that some people will probably argue with me about in the comments or point out exceptions to every rule, but this is all based on my own understanding and generalizing about these types of filaments and printers. First off, there are essentially four parts of a 3D printer that determine what it can do. The bed, the heat break, the nozzle, and the extruder. First off, the bed. This is either a heated bed or not. Almost every 3D printer with a heated bed can reach high enough temperatures to print every material I'll discuss in this video. Also, even $180 cheap China Special printers these days come with a heated bed, so this will not be a concern to almost anyone who's about to buy one. However, the other aspect of the bed that really matters is its material. The material of your bed surface can dramatically affect bed adhesion for different materials, but this is frequently not as big an issue as it sounds like, because there are many manufacturers who will happily sell you magic goop that makes anything stick to anything else, for a price. I'll discuss what you need for each material as they come up. The heat break. Second is the heat break. This one's even simpler. You either have a PTFE lined heat break or an all metal heat break. The 3D printer extruder filament path has only three elements, a heat break, a block, and a nozzle. The filament passes through the heat break, through a cold side with a heat sink, progressively gets hotter as it gets to the hot side with the heater block. It starts to melt as it approaches the block, then it gets hot enough to squeeze through the tiny nozzle opening by the time it gets there, all pushed through by the extruder, which I'll get to in a minute. Every cheap China special printer for the most part comes with a standard or PTFE lined hot end. PTFE is just the chemical name for the plastic commonly known as Teflon after the largest brand name behind it. Teflon will break down and release toxic carcinogenic fumes at temperatures above 230 to 240 Celsius. If you don't have an all metal hot end, you should never try to print with anything above those temperatures or you'll risk getting all the cancer or something. Fortunately, you can purchase fancy all-metal titanium heat breaks for like $15 and swap it yourself, but if you don't know what you're doing, it's easy to mess this up. I've screwed it up multiple times myself, and it really sucks and can get expensive fast. That said, there's a million tutorials for doing this on YouTube already from people more experienced than me, so I won't get into it. I just had to perform this swap on my new Sidewinder X2, and I used an even fancier bimetal heat break that has a copper section with a titanium insert. It took me about 30 to 40 minutes to get it right, but so far hasn't failed for a couple hours of printing. Next up is the nozzle. The nozzle is even simpler than the heat break in terms of what to watch out for. You either have a standard brass nozzle, or some sort of super crazy fancy hardened steel, abrasion resistant coating, etc, etc. There's a bajillion different kinds of different nozzles, but for the most part, you're either getting a brass nozzle or a copper nozzle that's too soft for abrasive filaments, or you're getting a nozzle that's made out of steel or has some sort of abrasion resistant coating that can print abrasive filaments. Some filaments are abrasive such as glass filled and carbon fiber filled nylons, which I have tried both of. There are weird abrasives too. Glow in the dark filament, for example, is abrasive due to the additive used to make it glow, and even some white filaments that use a titanium dioxide pigment can be abrasive. I have an E3D Nozzle X hardened steel nozzle in my Prusa Mark 3S, so I can print all of these materials just fine. 
but most printers, including the Prusa, come stock with a brass nozzle because they're super cheap and can print basically everything else perfectly. Like with bed adhesives, there are a million companies with their magic sauce nozzles, like a ruby tip or whatever. The only thing that really matters is the diameter of the hole at the tip. Standard is 0.4, but if you're willing to trade off detail for speed, you can go bigger, assuming your extruder and heater can also handle it. I intend to put a 0.6mm nozzle on my sidewinder so I can print faster, but 0.4 is fine for everything really. Lastly, there's the extruder. This can get a bit complicated, as again, there are hundreds of versions out there with each company claiming that theirs is better, but at the end of the day, most break down into two types, Bowden or Direct Drive. I know that lots of people who own Ender 3s are going to yell at me for saying this, but generally Direct Drive is just better, especially when we're talking about printing with flexible filaments. It's extremely difficult to push on a rope, and that is what Bowden printers try to do. Bowden printers have the extruder motor remotely located, fixed to the frame, and they push filament through a Bowden tube to the hot end, hence the name. Direct Drive, however, has the extruder motor mounted straight to the gantry and it moves around with the hot end, and it feeds filament straight down into it with a motor moving on the gantry. That said, you can easily buy third-party direct drive extruders for most printers if you're willing to rewire the entire thing yourself and do a bunch of firmware changes or whatever else is needed. And also in some cases, you can buy a direct drive conversion kit that will reduce the work involved by allowing the same firmware and maybe even the same wiring to be used from the original printer. The only downside to direct drive is it makes the moving parts of the printer heavier. So if it accelerates too fast or prints too fast, you can get some wobbly lines called ghosting appearing in your prints at sharp corners or direction changes. It also may be harder to clear jams depending on the design, though I haven't really had issues with jams in a long time. Knock on wood. Speaking of 3D printing, if you need some really detailed prototype parts or a large number of small parts and don't own a capable enough hobby printer yourself, check out PCBWay's 3D printing service. Admittedly, this is far more expensive than printing yourself if you have a hobby machine that can do it, but PCBWay is capable of 3D printing in materials that are impossible for any hobby 3D printer, including metals like titanium, tool steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. Just recently, I got a set of 7075 aluminum parts CNC machined by PCBWay, which I put on my bot Shrapnel Mine. This bot just fought at the sword competition, and I'll show a recap of that soon, where you can see that it was able to complete five fights and none of those parts ever failed. They worked perfectly and came just in time. And that's not to mention their awesome PCB fabrication and assembly services that they're known for. Check them out at the link below. Finally, let's get to the filaments. I'm going to cover about seven major groups of filaments and talk about the general use cases for them and what I've used them for and how they've worked for me in those applications. Let's first start with PLA. All the bright yellow parts in here are printed in PLA. I think this was the sample spool that my first printer that I bought when I graduated from college came with and it's a disgusting color that I have not used since. Um, this stuff is really brittle and extremely easy to break. Um, However, when it is printed in not super thin sections, it's also extremely rigid and actually pretty strong. Um, that said, it tends to shatter like glass, unlike something like a nylon that has some flex to it and is more durable. So generally, this is a very bad choice for a combat robot part that's going to actually take a direct hit. Um, it also has a very low melting point and it has a decent amount of friction, so it's not great for gears either, but with some lubrication, you can kind of make it work. It also is extremely cheap though, which is one of the main benefits to it for prototyping. So it's super easy to print on pretty much every single 3D printer on the market, and it's cheap. So for prototyping, PLA is pretty good. However, my preference is actually for prototyping in PETG. PETG is uh, quite a bit better than PLA for durability. It's got a bit more give to it before it'll just like snap, but it still can just break in a kind of brittle fashion. So it's still not the best for parts that might get directly hit by a robot. All of these parts in this bin, for the most part, all the light blue and dark blue ones, are printed in uh, Overture PETG. Um, this black part is nylon, but you can ignore that. I printed prior versions of it in PETG first. Like PLA, PETG is pretty easy to print. You might need a little bit more time to dial it in, especially because it likes to string a little bit and goop up on nozzles sometimes. But for the most part, you can print it on any printer 
It doesn't need to print at a high enough temperature that you would need an all metal hot end, so you can print it at like 220 to 230 C usually. And uh, it makes really nice parts that look great. And I have actually used them successfully functionally in my robots, so I'll show you when I grab a strap of mine. So on strap of mine, these arms and the drive gears that I used in combat are PETG. And the only real reason that I used the drive gears in PETG was because I printed them in nylon and the nylon ones I printed wrong and they broke. And I swapped back to my prototype parts and they worked perfectly for three more fights. Uh, the arms were never going to get directly hit by anything and if I was driving properly. So because I was having problems with nylon parts warping, since this is a relatively thick part with not a huge amount of surface area, I decided to just go with the nice flat PTG ones to make sure the arm would be aligned properly. I could have maybe used TPU for this, but I'll talk about why I didn't when I get to TPU. So yeah, PTG works pretty well. It's not nearly as durable as nylon, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper, usually 20 to $30 per kilogram, whereas PLA is in the 20, or maybe the 15 to $25 per kilogram range. Uh, but generally you can find them for around the same price. And uh, it's harder to get a really cheap crappy PETG than it is to get a really cheap crappy PLA when you go for the really cheap ones, in my experience. So I just generally stick to a couple brands so that things print consistently and I can just use the same settings for everything. PETG, like I said, has a little bit more flex than PLA. Um, but it still will kind of crack. Um, the other thing that it's better than PLA in is having better temperature resistance. So I've had some parts where I had a motor like secured to, to a piece of mini mulcher that I printed in PLA and it started to like melt. Um, nylon and PETG both will probably not do that. So now let's talk about nylon. This is a nylon lid for mini mulcher, obviously. Um, I prototyped some nylon parts early on for division as well. This is a nylon part. This is a PTG part. I know they're both clear, sorry. Um, but I'll probably be able to demonstrate this better with some pliers. This PTG part's a little different, but it's very, very rigid compared to a softer nylon like this. This is, I think, Esun brand. Uh, nylon from Amazon that's like relatively cheap and it's a little bit harder to print than like an alloy 910 but you can see it has quite a bit more give to it without just snapping. So nylon is generally a much more durable plastic. It is one of the most preferred plastics for printing combat robot parts. I have a ton of clear and black alloy 910 nylon parts. Alloy 910 being a Talman brand specific kind of nylon that is used extremely widely in robot combat. That's because it performs really, really well. So like this is a pulley printed in a black Isla 910, for example. I have to try and not buy too many black filaments so that I don't mix them up. But um, this is definitely a nylon pulley. And nylon is great because it's really low friction, which means it's great for pulleys and gears and things that might rub together. It has excellent durability because it has a little bit of flex to it and it's much less likely to crack or fail in a brittle fashion like glass than say a PLA for instance. It's not terribly expensive. I mean you can get nylon spools for as low as $40 a kilogram but you can also get nylons that are much more expensive with fancy modifiers and stuff so like LA 910 I think is closer to 60 per kilogram. Um, the tricky parts about nylon are primarily that you need to print it at a higher temperature. It warps like a motherfucker. So if you can't get great bed adhesion or just have complicated part geometry or not very much surface area, it's really easy for that to be a problem. Especially if you're trying to print like a whole robot chassis, like a part like this that's like really thin might be fine. But if you're doing this, but like taller, then that bottom parts that's on the heated bed is expanded because it's hot. But as it goes up, the parts cooling and cooling and cooling and trying to pull in. So the, the chassis will just start to like peel up. I've had tons of problems with this, even printing inside of an enclosure with my Prusa. Um, and one of the reasons I have that problem with the Prusa in particular, 
is that the Prusa has a spring steel magnetic bed. So one of the reasons that I decided to get the uh, Sidewinder X2 as my second printer was to see if having a glass bed that can't just peel off of the uh, heating surface might help deal with some of that warping if it's stuck down well enough. Um, so aside from warping, it needs to be printed at a hotter temperature. I generally print my nylons at 265 or 270 degrees, which is hotter than recommended because that gives you better layer adhesion. And with proper layer adhesion, nylon parts are absolutely excellent at sticking together. So that's one of the other advantages to nylon. Uh, PETG's layer adhesion is like pretty good. Uh, I think it's generally a bit better than PLA's, but nylon is like one of the most exceptional materials for just being really nice and durable and sticking together. And like I said, it's really nice for mechanical parts like gears. Um, so these were like prototypes of what I was going to use on Trapple Mine at one point. And here are some in PETG for comparison. You can see these are actually worn because I used them on the robot. All right, next let's talk about flexibles. I don't really have any in this bin, so I might have to run and grab some other stuff, but here is one example of a flexible TPU part. So the only, I've only really tried printing with a couple different variants of TPU because everyone recommended using Cheetah, which is what this is printed in. That's a specific type of uh, TPU by NinjaFlex. Uh, when you look at TPUs online, you'll see some number followed by a letter A usually and that refers to the hardness. So there's a shore hardness scale, you should look it up. This is around a 95A hardness, and it's pretty freaking squishy when it's printed with uh, not very many walls. But if you print something with a lot of walls, it can still be pretty durable. Let's see. So this is another cheetah part. Um, just a little test benchy. And the nice thing about flexible filaments is that I could like slam this with a sledgehammer like 50 times and it'll just keep springing back to roughly the same shape. It's like extraordinarily durable, but of course that's also with the trade-off of it being not rigid like at all. So if you make your whole robot chassis out of this, you might have a bad day because nothing will line up if you try to join, you know, like a belt with two pulleys and they're mounted to a TPU frame and the TPU frame squishes, the belt's gonna fly off. Um, so you do have to be careful about how you use it but used in the right way, it can make for some nigh indestructible parts. I mean, like this thing, when there was a fork in it, like it could twist, it could bend, it could do whatever. And that fork was not gonna go anywhere unless it like literally ripped straight through this huge amount of TPU here. So it's fantastic for armor, but it's less fantastic for making your entire frame. Nylon is a good blend of durability and rigidity, so that's the sort of thing like I use for mini mulcher that you could do for the entire frame. Next up, let's talk about some filled filaments. So this is an example of a carbon fiber nylon part. This is a Sane Smart carbon fiber nylon. So it's actually about the same price as the regular Talloy, or Talman Alloy 910 that I print regular nylon parts from. Um, so this stuff is a lot more rigid actually than uh, standard nylon but that also makes it more brittle and a lot less impact resistant. Uh, a lot of people seem to be under the impression that carbon fiber make better, but that's actually not true. Carbon fiber makes stiffer and a little bit stronger in tensile strength, but a lot weaker in terms of just kind of general durability. The reason that you would want to use a carbon fiber nylon in place of a regular nylon is because it's a lot stiffer it has a lot higher temperature resistance, so it prints a bit hotter, but it won't melt at nearly the same temperature. If I were to like put a sustained flame on this for a bit versus a regular nylon, the regular nylon will start to melt a little bit sooner than this will. And you can see there's still some flex to it, which means it's still somewhat durable. It's probably more durable than say like a PETG, but it's definitely less durable than a plain nylon, to be clear. Unless you're printing with a Mark Force printer in like Onyx, which happens to maintain a lot more flexibility than this stuff does, but it's also like five times the price. So, you know, it is what it is. So carbon fiber nylon in general is maybe not a great chassis material, to be honest, because of the fact that it is a bit more brittle than regular nylon. But if you have a part that needs to be rigid and 
that also might take a hit, um, it might be a good choice depending how you use it. The alternative to this stuff that's a little bit better for that kind of application is a glass fiber nylon. So I've only been very briefly experimenting with this, but this is Saint Smart's glass nylon. It is much harder for me to print this stuff. I think generally speaking, glass nylon and carbon fiber nylon print about the same. Like if you get your printer dialed in for say Matter Hackers Nylon X, which is carbon fiber nylon, and then you buy some Matter Hackers Nylon G, which is glass fiber nylon, then it's probably gonna work fine. Just the Saint Smart stuff is really hard to print well for some reason. Um, you can see there's like some some brown blobs here where it like gets stuck on the nozzle and like burned a bit and then got redeposited back into the print, which is not great. And it's for some reason like under extruding top layers and it gets all melty and weird because it cools a bit slower, I think, than the uh, carbon fiber nylon. Um, but this maintains a little bit more of that flexibility and impact resistance of plain nylon while still being very durable overall. So it's like kind of in between the rigidity of regular nylon and carbon fiber nylon, a bit more impact resistant than carbon fiber nylon, and still has a lot of the benefits of reduced, uh, or like a higher temperature resistance. Oh, the other thing is both um, carbon fiber nylon and glass fiber nylon tend to warp a bit less than standard nylon. Um, especially glass nylon supposedly warps a bit less than uh, regular nylon when printing. So if you're willing to spend $125 per kilogram on like a nylon G, then you should probably get the brand name stuff from Matter Hackers, nylon G. But I haven't been bothered to afford that yet since I've been doing pretty well with just the $60 per kilogram standard nylons for most of my stuff. A while back when I was trying to prototype for Division's drive gear boxes, I bought a spool of Polymaker Polylight Polycarbonate. Not to be confused with Polymaker's Polymax Polycarbonate because they decided to name their things weird. Um, I'm not 100% sure this is it. This might be a clear PETG instead, but I think this is it because it's way harder for me to break this than it was the PETG benches I found. Um, but polycarbonate is the same stuff that arena box walls are made out of. It is extremely impact resistant, but it is also actually extremely stiff, which you wouldn't think by looking at it in a sheet form. Um, but com even compared to like a carbon fiber nylon, this probably rivals that or is stiffer than it. Um, it also still has a decent amount of impact resistance though, despite being so stiff, but it's incredibly hard to print. It absorbs water like crazy, just like nylon does, but possibly even worse. So you basically need to be printing both of those out of a dry box and drying them. I forgot to mention that before. Um, you don't need a hardened steel nozzle for this like you do for carbon fiber nylon, but you do need to be able to reach insane temperatures. So don't even think about trying it if you don't already have a all metal heat break and it warps even worse because it shrinks so much more than a nylon and it's harder to get it to stick down to bed surfaces generally. So it's incredibly hard to actually get a good print with this stuff. Then I eventually returned the spool that I bought to Amazon because I could not get consistent results with it and the temperatures needed to print it at caused my cooling duct fan to melt <laughs> on my Prusa. So I might attempt it again with the Sidewinder because the Sidewinder has all the parts near the hot end made out of metal, but I don't even think it's worth it because it's really expensive too. So there are definitely uses for it, but within the combat robotics world, I think 90% of the time, you're probably gonna be better off with a nylon or glass nylon or carbon fiber nylon than you will be with polycarbonate given how much harder it is to actually get good prints out of it and how expensive it is. One filament type that I have not personally used in any of my robots is ABS or ASA. Those are two different filaments, though in my opinion, ABS shouldn't exist anymore because ASA is about the same price and better in every conceivable way. Um, ABS used to be used back in the day when 3D printing filaments weren't really a thing and you could only really get a few materials. And ABS is relatively strong. It's somewhat impact resistant, but it's super, super rigid and brittle and it is horrible to print. Not only does it shrink a ton and warp horribly and need to be kept dry a little bit, but it also 
has the ability of releasing toxic styrene fumes the whole time that it is melting in the hot end, which can poison you over time, so that's not great. Um, you pretty much can't print it at all without really, really good bed adhesion and or an enclosure, preferably both, and I just wouldn't even bother because the only real benefit to it is that you can solvent weld it with acetone. If you're thinking of using this stuff, don't. Instead, you should use ASA. Acrylonitrile styrene acrylate ate ABS's lunch, drank ABS's milkshake, convinced the crew ABS was the imposter, bolted its bird, pineapple its home portal, and f***ed its wife. ASA is strictly better than ABS in all respects, and it adds some unique properties of its own. For anything that you would want to use ABS for, you should really just use ASA, which still releases toxic styrene fumes, but pretty much all of the other aspects that I talked about ABS sucking at, it does a little bit better and it, I think, also has improved UV resistance for outdoor applications. That said, I would still way prefer nylon over an ASA any day of the week. One last thing, um, I had somebody interested in building a copy of Division, and because of that, and the fact that I'm already planning on redesigning Division from the ground up for a version three at some point next year, I decided to sell him the collection of parts that I had for Division V2.12. But I still have all of these parts from divisions version 1 through 2. Dot probably 10 or so. Um, and I have no use for any of these two. So uh, I guess if you would like to buy any of these, let me know in the comments. And I might list a few on eBay or something. I don't really know what to do with this. I even got a bent uh, original weapon disc from versions 1 and 2.0. That's all I have for you today. If you liked this video, click like. If you want to see more videos like this, get subscribed and click the bell icon. Also, let me know in the comments if you thought this video was helpful or if you'd like me to expand on this topic in the future, maybe going outside of just 3D printed materials. If you didn't like the video, then uh, as far as you're concerned, you're the only one because public dislike counts are currently disabled. Thanks, YouTube. That's all I've got. Bye.